I'm Lawrence Weschler, the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities, and we are very pleased today to be collaborating with the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice of the School of Law here at NYU, this building, and especially uh, thanking Philip Alston and uh, Vera Upkenhofen uh, for their help in putting this together. Uh, I think you're going to be in for a, a remarkable evening. Uh, Without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our main reason for convening, which is uh, we have with us uh, Mariam Al Khawaja, who is the acting director of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And uh, she's going to tell us a bit of what's going on in Bahrain, and we'll get right into that. And then afterwards, uh, we'll talk for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then we'll invite the panelists up to continue the conversation. But here's Mariam Al Khawaja. <laughs> So, Marion, we agreed that you would give us a, a little geography lesson for starters, and, or, you know, the whole line about uh, geography is how uh, a war is how Americans learn geography. This is preparing for war is how Americans learn geography, because this is where our fifth fleet is. Uh, but you've got that there, or I can even show it to you here. Yeah. And then there, and then there. So what is that? Um, first of all, thank you all for coming here tonight. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you all. Um, of course, that's a map of Bahrain. Um, what's interesting about Bahrain, first of all, is its geopolitical importance because of where it's located in the Gulf. Um, of course, one of our closest neighbors is Saudi Arabia, and a big reason of why the Bahraini quote-unquote spring is not heard about much and also why there was a huge campaign to try and put down the popular protests that was calling for change and democracy and freedom. Um, so the you know, geopolitical context is very, very important when you talk about the human rights situation inside Bahrain. Uh, what's interesting about the island is the fact that it's made up of 33 different islands. Of those 33 islands, there are three islands where people actually live. Most of the others are privately owned by the ruling family. Of the main islands- Three um, out of 30. Three out of 33. Three out of 33, excuse me. Yeah. So the main island, which is usually seen as the map of Bahrain, the bottom half, almost all of it, is also owned by the ruling family and not accessible for the citizens of Bahrain. Of the upper half, where the people are allowed to live and which is very highly condensed per capita, um, a lot of spaces within that upper half is also owned by the ruling family. And what's interesting about Bahrain is that it's one of the islands in the world with almost no public beaches that are accessible to the citizens. Almost all of it is privately owned, whether by the ruling family or people close to them. So just looking at the geography of Bahrain in itself is very interesting and very telling of the political, economical situation of the country. Okay, and now talk a bit about the situation that has developed there and America's role in it. And I'm just sure. gonna let you go. You rip, go, <laughs> go girl. <laughs> um, so to take you back a little bit, to understand the background of Bahrain, Bahrain actually has had one of the oldest civil rights movements in the region. So since the 1920s, people have been demanding civil rights. Um, and since the 1920s, almost every 10 years, there's been some sort or some form of uprising in the country where people have demanded civil rights, more liberties, more freedoms, more human rights, and so on. Um, and every time the government or regime uh, responds usually in the same way, which is the use of violence to put down these protests. And of course, Bahrain was a British protectorate for quite some time until the 1970s. And in the 1950s, there was an uprising that was actually put down by the help of the British um, during that time. Now, of course, like I said, because it's every 10 years, the last uprising in Bahrain was in the 1990s, uh, where people again rose up demanding the return of the 1973 constitution, which gives them a real constitutional monarchy. But I'm not going to bore you with all of these, you know, details about what's happening in Bahrain in the past, so I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening there today. Of course, you all heard about the protests that started in Bahrain, the pro-democracy popular protests, which started on the 14th of February 2011. And this date is very important because it's also Valentine's Day. Um, and the people of Bahrain celebrated it by presenting their love to their country and taking to the streets to demand um, more political rights and a new constitution that actually represents the people of Bahrain. The 2002 constitution was put in unilaterally by the king um, who gave himself more or less absolute power and created a parliament that didn't have 
monitoring or legislative power. Um, and so people came out demanding reforms. They weren't demanding the, you know, stepping down of the regime. They weren't demanding anything like what we saw in Tunisia and Egypt, but rather reforms and a delivery on the promises that the king had made in 2001 of, you know, the beautiful days that we had yet to live, which nobody really lived. Um, and so, well, one, let me start one thing. The, mm -hmm. the royal family is how many people? The rest of the population is how many people, roughly? I'm not quite sure. Um, the ruling family, according to my knowledge, is there are thousands of them. Um, but of course, there's the ruling elite, and the ruling elite are the people who actually rule the country and have most of the control on the economical and political situation. The population of Bahrain is about 600, 700,000 people when you're talking about the citizens. So it's very, very tiny. The uh, size of Bahrain is about 3.5 times the size of Washington, D.C. So it's quite small. Um, to add to that, there's a population of migrant workers who are about 51% of the population. So there's about 700,000 migrant workers in Bahrain as well. Um, and of course, the migrant workers are an entire issue in themselves because it's the um, best example of what modern day slavery looks like, especially in the Gulf countries today. But that's to give you an idea of what the population actually looks like um, in regards to capacity. But that also brings me to my next point, which is why Bahrain to, to a certain extent was overlooked. You know, when you're talking about, for example, 100 people killed in Bahrain, but you're talking about thousands killed in other countries, a lot of times people say, well, you know, that's only 100 people, it's not that important. And of course, as a human rights defender, I don't think that comparisons should be made to begin with because every human, uh, every human life matters and every death is one death too many. But at the same time, also looking at Bahrain from a per capita perspective, um, 100 deaths in Bahrain would equal thousands of deaths, for example, in Egypt because of the difference in the population number. And so Bahrain, the, crack, the crackdown in Bahrain has been one of the worst in what is known today as the Arab Spring. And it also had the largest protests in what is known as the Arab Springs. Almost 50% of the Bahraini population took to the streets to demand change uh, during 2011. And so imagine having about 300 to 400,000 people out on the streets saying, we want a new constitution, we want uh, change in freedom and liberties and so on. So this was a massive uprising, popular uprising, where people peacefully demanded change. And of course, like any good oppressive regime does, they responded with violence, and people got shot and killed. Now what happened was in March 2011, there was a national strike where almost the entire country came to a standstill because people stopped going to work, they stopped going to universities, to schools, and so on. And most people were in the, what was known as the Pearl Square, which is the Bahraini version of the Tahrir Square in Egypt. And so people gathered there, and the regime came to a point where they had to make a choice. They either started to initiate real reforms, or they had to start a very violent crackdown. And so with the assistance of other Gulf countries, uh, we had something similar in the way it's presented to Libya. We had a foreign military intervention in Bahrain. But it wasn't like the NATO intervention in Libya, where they helped the people against the dictator. Rather, on the contrary, the Gulf Cooperation Council forces named the Peninsula Shield, mostly in the form of Saudi and UAE troops, the United Arab Emirates, crossed the bridge from Saudi Arabia into Bahrain and helped the regime put down a popular uprising. On that, you can see the bridge there that Yes, yeah. the bridge that connects Saudi Arabia to Bahrain. And so what happened was a massive widespread crackdown started. Thousands and thousands of people were arrested. Most of them were subjected to systematic torture in the form of psychological, physical, and sexual torture. Uh, thousands of people were sacked from their jobs. Around 6,000 people were sacked from their jobs for participating in protests. Some, in some cases, you know, I had friends who were sacked from their job for liking a picture on Facebook. It was that simple. You had to do something as simple as press, you know, click like on a picture on Facebook to lose your job in Bahrain. Um, but then it also went further than that. They started using uh, very violent means and excessive use of force against peaceful protesters who continued to come out demanding change. And so this very widespread violent crackdown started, and to this date it continues. Since the 14th of February, since March 2011, the protests in Bahrain have not stopped. Almost every single day there are protests in several areas around Bahrain where people continue to take to the streets to demand change, to demand human rights, to demand freedom and dignity. And 
On a daily basis, when people take to the streets to make these demands, the Bahraini government continues to use violent methods and violent means against the protesters. Um, to take it a step further and talk about the international perspective towards the situation in Bahrain. We're looking at a situation where now we're speaking about an ally of the West. This is not a government that the West looks upon unfavorably because there's someone who has a good economical and security relationship with countries like the United States and like the United Kingdom and the EU and so on. And unfortunately, that has been a very bad position for the Bahraini people who have come out to demand change. You know, President Obama came out in 2011 and said, wherever people come out to demand freedom and uh, dignity or democracy, they will find a friend in the United States of America. And the people of Bahrain did that. They did take to the streets and they did demand freedom and democracy. And yet, they did not find a friend in the United States of America. And, and let's be clear, the United States of America is physically right there in the Fifth yes, Fleet. Yes, exactly, in, in the form of the Fifth Fleet. And not only that, I mean, the people of Bahrain, with all of their demands, with all of their uh, movement, they never were asking for a military intervention. They were not asking for NATO to come in and bomb the regime and free them from the regime. It was basically their only demand was that these countries that say that they hold human rights and freedom and democracy as you know, the cornerstone of their foreign policy, that they actually act upon this. That when they say they support human rights and democracy, then it's everywhere, not just in the countries where there are governments that they don't like. And so people were hoping that that's what they were going to see from the United States of America, as well as the United Kingdom and other countries, that they would do the very least of holding the Bahraini government accountable for the ongoing human rights abuses. And unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. The reason why the situation or the human rights situation in Bahrain continues to deteriorate today is because of the issue of, of impunity, the lack of accountability. And first and foremost, there's a lack of accountability on the local level. When we're talking about Bahrain, we're talking about a country where in 2002, they passed Law 56. Law 56 gave immunity to every person who had been involved in human rights crimes in the 1990s. Some of those people are still in government today. And so it makes sense that we're looking at the situation that we're looking at. And the same thing for 2011. The very same people who were involved in the human rights violations are either in the same position or sometimes have been promoted the head of the national security apparatus, which according to the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, which the government of Bahrain accepted as being true, uh, was actually promoted from the head of the NSA to being a, a king's advisor at a minister's rank. And so we're looking at a culture of impunity where if you're affiliated with the government, you can get away with just about anything. The few cases that did go to court of police officers who killed protesters, which were very, very few, were of the lowest rank of police officers. And even then, when they were found guilty, they were given up to seven years. Seven years imprisonment for torturing someone to death. Seven years. Whereas we have human rights defenders being sentenced up to life imprisonment on charges of freedom of expression. This is the situation that we have in Bahrain today. And those are the police officers that have been convicted. There are many of those who have been found innocent of crimes of killing or torture and so on. I, I wanted to bring out a bit. Um, uh, earlier today, you and I were talking, and you mentioned the, uh, the situation of the medical uh, services in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. It's the surgeons and so forth. So one of the cases that actually got a lot of international attention was the case of the medical workers. The doctors in Bahrain, you know, they witnessed or were a part of a situation that they never had seen before. You know, basically getting injuries of people, you know, shot with e either live ammunition or tear gas or pellets. They received cases where someone was brought in with half his head missing because he was killed in an execution style manner by a police officer. And so their response was to treat these patients. Their response, part of their Hippocratic oath is to treat anyone that comes into the hospital. And that's what they did. And because they were the first-hand witnesses of the violations of what was happening in Bahrain, because they started to talk about this, and because they refused to stop treating protesters even when the decision came in from the Ministry of Interior that they were no longer allowed to treat protesters that were coming to the hospital, there was a order that ambulances were not allowed to go to the Pearl Square where people were being shot and beaten and killed at some times. Um, they decided to protest against this. And because of this, uh, many of them were arrested, many of them were tortured, 
and some of them continue to serve prison sentences today inside Bahrain. And so when you're looking at this- You were just, mentioning the surgeon, that there's a desperate lack of surgeons in, in Bahrain right now. Yeah, so Bahrain being as small as it is, um, there are only a few doctors that are specialized within their field. And so for example, when you're talking about surgeons, there's also only specific amount of surgeons who can do or conduct certain types of injuries or certain types of surgeries. Some of these surgeons today are in prison. And so there's a lack of doctors within the hospital. Um, we actually, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights recently did an entire report on the medical situation inside Bahrain titled the limited uh, access to health and uh, breach of medical neutrality in Bahrain. And we covered all of the different cases of not only the fact that hospitals in Bahrain are militarized and that protesters who get injured cannot go to the hospital. Um, imagine you get shot, even if you're passing by, you're not participating in a protest. You're passing by and you get shot and you're severely injured, you cannot go to a hospital. Because before you can even see a doctor, you will be met by someone from the intelligence services or someone from the NSA or someone from the public prosecution who is going to interrogate you. I met a 17 year old boy who was shot in the face with a tear gas canister, lost his left eye, and was at the hospital coming in and out of consciousness, and he was being interrogated. Not allowed to receive medical attention until he answered the questions of the public prosecution. And so we're looking at a very severe case where people don't even have access to medical facilities. But even further than that, even if you're not a protester, even if you're someone with chronic illness, for example, you have cancer and you need to go to get chemo at the hospital. Or you need to go because you're very sick and you need to get a checkup. And you walk into the hospital, there are around 200 different C C CCTV cameras installed around the hospital. Imagine sitting in an examination room where you need to talk, about the, to, talk to the doctor about personal issues, personal health issues, or you need to take off your clothes so he can examine you. And there's a camera up there where you don't know how many people sitting in the Ministry of Interior are watching while you interact with your doctor. This is just, the problem is, is that I can talk for hours about the situation in Bahrain, but this is just scratching the surface of all of the different levels and all of the different situations of breaches of human rights for the people of Bahrain. Uh, I have a few questions. I'm kicking myself right now because you sent me a graphic the other day. Maybe you'll be able to tell people where to find it on the, on the internet. But one of the reasons we get so little of this kind of discussion of what's going on in Bahrain is because the royal family lavishes money on PR firms in the United States. Do you, can you just give a sense of that? I, I don't have the chart, but you, you sent it to me. It was a great chart. Um, you can actually find this on the Bahrain Watch website, bahrainwatch.org. And what they've done is they actually did a study of how the Bahraini regime uses PR companies, public relations companies in Europe and the United States to try and better their image internationally. And what's interesting is that in the past two years alone, they have um, employed up to 13 different public relations companies. These are the big ones, Sa Saatchi and Knowlton and all the big names are. are yeah, so it's Corvus, for example, and so on. And they've gone up to 13 PR companies just to try and better their image, but also to spread propaganda about what is going on in Bahrain. You know, naming the Bahraini revolution as being, um, you know, schemed or planned by Iran. Because everyone knows as soon as you put Iran in the mix, everyone says, oh, well, we can't, you know, we can't deal with this or we need to be very careful about how we get involved or if we support these protesters and their demands. Um, so that's part of what they've been doing. But then they've also been using this to defame activists inside Bahrain to try and take away from their credibility. And something that I always find funny is I get attacked as a human rights defender and called a spy for Israel and for Iran and for the United States. And I always say that, you know, I must be the smartest person on earth if I can bring these three governments together to pay yeah. me at the same time. <laughs> that being said, a lot of governments out there owe me a lot of money, so they need to pay up. But, you know, this is just part of the PR campaign that the Bahraini government uses to attack human rights defenders and activists. And the defamation campaigns are not something that started with the uprising in Bahrain. It's something that went far beyond that. Since many years ago, human rights defenders in Bahrain are constantly targeted in defamation campaigns and attacks and so on. And this has spread into other Gulf countries as well. This phenomena of attacking human rights defenders because they are at the forefront of documenting human rights abuses and talking to the international community. The difference is when you're talking to a pol politician, you know, it's always a gray area. You can agree or disagree on what the situation should be or what the political outcome should be or the solution should be. But when you're talking about human rights, it's black and white. 
There is no such thing as justifying human rights violations. There are no excuses for human rights violations. And so for many of these regimes in the Middle East and North Africa region, human rights defenders have become the number one enemy because they are the people who, when they talk about what's going on in, the, in these countries, there's no excuse, there's no justification. And so they get targeted. But what's really sad about the situation of human rights defenders in the Gulf in general, and not just Bahrain, is that internationally they're isolated. When you come out as a human rights defender in places like the UAE or Saudi Arabia or Bahrain or otherwise, you're not only targeted by your own government, you're not only putting your life and your family on the line, but you're also not receiving much international support. Um, you tend to, one of the things, well, let me put it this way. First of all, how old are you? 25. <laughs> And you are the youngest. I, I want, you don't like to talk about your family, but I do like to talk about your family, so I'm going to get you to talk about your family. Um, you are the youngest. And I, and I just to give one example of a family that's doing human rights work and what happens to them in a situation like this. So you are the youngest of, the third of four daughters of this fellow here. There's yeah. dad. <laughs> Can you tell us who he is? Well, that's my father, Abdel Hadi Khwaja. He's an internationally known human rights defender. Uh, he actually was the co-founder of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights in 2001 inside Bahrain. Uh, and he went on to work as the regional director for Frontline Defenders, which is based in Ireland. And he covered the entire Middle East and North Africa region, uh, both working and supporting with human rights defenders across the region, but also training people on human rights work and uh, documentation. We should so say on. that he, he grew up in Bahrain, left as a student. Yes and eventually settles in Copenhagen, is that right? Yes, uh, my family, um, both my father and my mother, were political refugees because like I said, the struggle in Bahrain is not something that started in 2011, it went far beyond that. And both my parents could not go back to Bahrain uh, because of their, the, their situation, uh, because they had both been active within the movement inside Bahrain. My father was more focused on political prisoners and the case of political prisoners, especially that his younger brother, who's also in prison with him today, um, was in prison at the time. Um, and my mother was someone who was also involved in the activism of you know, um, coordinating and organizing protests um, a while back before she left Bahrain when she was around 18 or 19 years old. And then when she had to leave Bahrain because of threats uh, of arrest and she had not been able to go back after that. And so they both, after having the three of us in Syria, they, we all moved to Denmark where we got political asylum and where we lived as refugees for about 12 years uh, without citizenship. The Bahraini government more or less withdrew the citizenship of most people in exile. So you grew up in Dan Denmark, hence your ex excellent English. Yes. <laughs> do you speak Danish too? <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. Uh, anyway, and then your family decides to go back and around the time that there seems to be an opening up happening with this new constitution and so forth, right? Or? Yes, for both my parents, um, you know, my father continued to be very active throughout his, uh, you know, the whole time that we were in Denmark. And he actually started the BHRO, the Bahrain Human Rights Organization in Copenhagen, which again focused on the issue and the plight of political prisoners in Bahrain. And in 2001, when the situation changed and um, Hamad bin Isa al Khalifa became the emir of Bahrain and then announced himself king later on, um, he, promised, he promised to allow people in exile to come back to Bahrain. And he promised a constitutional monarchy, which he failed to deliver on. But he did allow people to go back. And my family, for my parents, their existence outside of Bahrain had always been something temporary. And so as soon as they got the opportunity to pack their bags and go back to Bahrain, that was the first thing that they did. And so we moved back to Bahrain in 2001 when I was 14 years old. And that's when my father founded the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And things shut down pretty quickly. This is a pretty horrible picture, but this is uh, from 2005. Uh, he, yeah. was, he was being already beaten then. Um, and then the pro-revolution happens. And can you describe the situations of when, how he was arrested and so forth? Sure. Um, on the 9th of April, 2011, my so father... So the pro-revolution is Valentine's Day. Yes, 14th of February. And then the crackdown, of course, happened in mid-March when the Saudi and the UAE troops came into the country. And that's when the widespread violence, systematic violence by the government started. And on the 9th of April, 2011, my family, um, including my father, my sisters, and my brothers-in-law, were all in my sister's apartment. And uh, they received news that the riot police had already broken into uh, our apartment and they were looking for my father. And so my father told my family that he would, first of all, they got my niece who was one years old at the time. 
uh, out of the apartment, and he asked my brothers-in-law to leave who refused to leave. And so he asked the, my family members not to respond or not to try and prevent the arrest in any way because it was well known by then that anyone who resists or tries to intervene in any arrest either gets arrested as well or gets beaten, as happened with the case of my uncle when they arrested him and his wife was sexually assaulted by the, by the police. And so within 30 seconds, they had broken down the door. They entered the apartment. And before my father, as he was telling them that he was going to go with them willingly, uh, they grabbed him from the neck, they dragged him down the staircase, and they started to beat him violently. There were about 15 or 20 of them. Um, my three brothers-in-law were also taken and beaten. Uh, they were taken downstairs to the bottom apartment and beaten as well. And by the time they were finished with my father, he was unconscious. Um, while they were beating him, my sister Zainab heard him saying continuously that he couldn't breathe. And she tried to intervene, saying, he was going to go with you willingly, so why are you beating him? And so one of the officers who we think, or we now know is Bedr al ghaith who continues to be a police officer today, um, ordered that they arrest my sister as well. And when my mother tried to intervene to stop them from taking my sister, she was pushed back on the staircase and they were all locked in the apartment upstairs. And when they took my father away, he was unconscious. They had, uh, he received a hard blow to the face which left, uh, left him with about six fractures in his jaw and he currently has to have around 34 or 36 metal plates that hold his jaw together with his face. Um, and they took him away unconscious. Of course, my family didn't know whether he was alive or dead. And right afterwards, my sister was tweeting about this, which is how I found out what happened as I was in the United States at the time. Um, she basically, the first thing she did is started cleaning up the blood because she knew that her one-year-old daughter would be coming home and she didn't want her to see that. Um, and of course, what happens in Bahrain is that when you're arrested, you disappear. They arrested two of my brothers-in-law, along with my father, although they have no political affiliations, are not human rights activists, um, and are not involved at all in the movement. Uh, but because they're related to us, they were arrested as well. And they were also severely tortured while imprisoned and released afterwards. Um, but what happens always in Bahrain, especially in 2011, is that when you're arrested, you disappear. And for some time, your family does not know whether you're alive or dead. And of course, we know as human rights defenders, and I've, I remember I talked about this with the Special Rapporteur on Torture from the United Nations as well, one of the times when we know that torture happens the most is when people are put in incommunicado detention. It's when they're cut off from the rest of the world that we have serious concerns about mistreatment and torture. And this is what happened and continues to happen to political prisoners in Bahrain. Uh, just recently, one of my colleagues, Naji Fatir, was arrested and he, was, he disappeared for about three days. And we still have serious concerns and we don't know what his situation or his well-being is. So this is something that not only happened in 2011, but continues to happen today. Coming back to your father, he was presently, he came, he, he was out of disappearance and he was put on trial and he was given a life sentence for all his beastly monstrousness, yeah? That is correct, yeah. And one of his responses to that was a hunger strike. Yes, um, so he was sentenced, he, start, he did several hunger strikes. After he was arrested, he was at the military hospital um, where he continued to be tortured while at the hospital after he had received surgery. And then he was moved to El Gurain prison, which is the military prison, where he continued to be tortured as well. Um, and at one point, because of uh, attempted rape on him by the police officers in charge, he had to continuously beat his head against the floor to prevent them from raping him, uh, which again caused damage to his face. Um, but he, and he did initiate a hunger strike at that time to try and prevent the torture that was happening. He conducted, like I said, several hunger strikes along with other uh, political prisoners in Bahrain. But the longest hunger strike that he did was 110 days, which happened last year, and which almost cost him his life. And it ended with the government force feeding let, him. Let me, let me stop for a second because mm -hmm. it's at this point where I, where I really began to hear about your family. But partly th uh, through what you were doing, but also partly through your, your sister at that point, was uh, on the outside. This is Zainab, yes. how, how old is she? Zainab is 29. Okay, and- with Don't tell her I said her age though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've got some pictures of her. She's famous for just doing things by herself, sitting in the middle of the street, um, trying to block traffic, trying to get attention to the fate of her father at that point on the hunger strike. Um, 
down here. Can you just tell what's happening? This was in November, because I have a little piece of video of, what, of this, but tell on the one on the right here what, what happened. That's in November. That was one of the first um, appearances for Zainab during the uprising. Um, she didn't know that she was being filmed by actually a New York uh, Times reporter. And uh, they had been attacking the youth in Sitra. The, um, the, one of the soldiers villages. had been Yeah, the, the riot police uh, had been attacking the protesters. And for, so she attempted to stop the riot police from continuously arresting let, or let, attacking let, let's, people. Let's just watch this, because this is kind of amazing to watch. <laughs> That's her by herself. I don't know who you have to pay in this country to get footage that, like that not shown on TV as much as you have the famous tank, the man in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square, but, but I know who does the pain, and I know who, who, how it happens. But anyway, so she is continually being thrown, thrown in jail and then gets out after a while and then gets thrown in again. How, many, how much has she? I've lost count, but I think it's around nine times that she's been in and out of prison now. She's also been beaten severely several times. She's been shot in the leg with a tear gas canister. Um, she's been subjected to quite a lot in the past two years. Uh, she's in prison right now. Yes. And uh, she recently released, uh, just around the time that we were all so pleased with ourselves about Martha Luther King and the March on Washington and the anniversary and so forth, she released a letter which was clearly rhyming off of his, a letter from prison. And the, it's an amazing document, you can find it online. Uh, uh, Zainab al Khawaja, uh, letter from a Bahraini prison. Uh, but part of it, she keeps on quoting Martin Luther King and in an amazing moment she's talking about how the doctor, because she, she goes on hunger strike too, I guess, and, and at one point the doctor is, why are you doing this? And she starts talking about Martin Luther King and she gives him her Martin Luther King book. And, and uh, but at one point, I thought she she turns from just talking about Martin Luther King in general to to uh, well this passage. This is aimed more at us, so I think you, you might read it for us. Sure. Uh, it says, as I read through Martin Luther King's words, I found myself wishing he was alive. I found myself wondering what he would have to say about the U.S. administration's support of Bahraini dictators what he would say about turning a blind eye to the blood and tears being spilt in the quest for freedom. All I had to do was turn a page, and this time Martin Luther King spoke not to me, but to you, to America. John F. Kennedy said, This those, is Martin Luther King talking. John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken. The role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investment. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. A nice line quote from Martin Luther King there. Um, there was a period a few months ago where she was out of prison and you yourself went back and there's some great pictures of you here meeting her at the airport. This was January and you were there for two weeks. Um, but, um, as I say, she's been thrown back in prison, and uh, what happens to her daughter, by the way? Um, well, her daughter is currently with- By the way, with... here's a picture of your mother with her. Yes. Your mother's pretty amazing, but then this is her daughter, Jude. Yeah. So Jude is three years old now, and she's currently living with her father, who was previously detained and tortured. 
And I think the most difficult thing for Zainab right now is that for the, almost the two months that she's been in prison, she has not been able to see her daughter. She's been prevented family visits, consular visits, lawyer visits, um, even access to sanitary items like shampoo and soap and so on. Uh, and even further to that, she's not been allowed outside of the prison facility. Usually prisoners are allowed to go outside um, to at least see the sky or the sun. Zainab has not been allowed outside of her cell for almost two months now. Um, on an earlier visit, um, there was one of, she, she tweets by the name Angry Arabia, right? Yes. And, um, uh, and she uh, had a, told a story about, this would have been maybe six months ago, where she was able, while in prison, to hear from her father mm -hmm. on, on the phone. And th these are, tweets are, as you know, just very short things, but this is a, a, a sequence. Maybe you could read this description of a conversation she had with her with your father. Sure, so she tweeted this after she was released from prison. And she wrote, so that's a total of three months that I did not see my father. During my two months in detention, I was allowed only one call to my dad. I don't want to share the difficulties of prison, but I do want to share that one phone call when I at last heard his voice. I remember running out of my cell when the prison guard told me that I could speak to my father. I couldn't believe it. And I remember as soon as I said hello, I heard another prison guard on the other side of the phone call, shouting at my father. Don't speak about politics, he shouted. And I could hear the irritation in the voice of my always proud father. It's always awkward when you have a few minutes to speak to someone you love, with police standing by listening to your conversation. But my father started with, listen Zainab, you know they built a wall around our outdoor area instead of the fence. We used to be able to see the sea. We could see the first light of the sunrise but they didn't want the other prisoners to see us. The other day I sat with one of the, pol the other political prisoners, right before sunrise. He turned to me and started reading a poem. How difficult it is to have a wall between you and the sunrise. How difficult to try and claw your way to see a little light. As my father read me the poem, I felt all of the anger and sadness in me come to surface. Yes, a wall surrounds us. He waited knowing what I was thinking and feeling. Then he said, but Zainab, I listened to his poem, then I asked him not to leave. We sat and waited and waited in complete silence until the sun was high up in the sky. Then I turned to my friend and told him, the sun always rises higher than the wall. You'll be in pain only if you concentrate on the wall. But if you, if you look at the big picture, you'll realize that in the end, the wall is, in fact, insignificant. I, I was going to ask you how you get up in the morning and keep doing what you're doing, but in a way, I guess that's kind of, sort of the answer. Maybe it's time to bring up uh, our, our uh, panelists. So why don't you, the three of you come up. Um, let me introduce them as they come up. First in the orange here is uh, Sarah Lee Whitson, who is the director of the Middle East Division of Human Rights Watch. Uh, and Ruth Wedgwood uh, of Johns Hopkins University, uh, who was a, a U.S. member of the UN Human Rights Commission Committee from 2003 to 2011, and then Ari A. Nair, uh, who was the founder of Human Rights Watch and for many, many years uh, the president of, of the Open Society Foundation, is now the emerita, or President Emeritus um, of Open Society Foundations. Um, Sarah, you, you were going to, uh, I have to find it here on the, on okay. one, one last look at Jude before we leave her there. <laughs> Let's see here. And uh, Let me just uh, preview this uh, and ask you to sort of separate, stop in between the two clips. Yeah. Um, since uh, uh, Zainab was talking about the political prisoners uh, in uh, Bahrain, I was in Bahrain in March. Uh, after a, a long while of, of begging and pleading for visas and finally acquiring visas in a highly structured uh, five-day visit that we were allowed. Uh, and I should say I was allowed in, but my colleague Joe Stork, uh, who has been banned from Iraq, was not allowed in. Uh, one of the remarkable aspects of that visit is that the uh, government allowed us to go to the prison. There's one major prison in Bahrain called Jao Prison. 
uh, to meet with the detainees and actually allowed us to photograph and film them. Uh, and uh, we have actually published the photographs and the government was very, very mad because they said, well, why did you publish these? And I said, well, why do you think we took the pictures? <laughs> uh, we hadn't actually shown the video clips because we've had technical difficulties, but here you'll get a sense of uh, some of the political prisoners uh, uh, in the prison, and, and some of them are political activists, and some of them are human rights activists. You'll see Mariam's father there, uh, sitting in the black t-shirt uh, and, and the white sweatpants and the others there. And I should note that after the pictures came out, uh, there were demands made that they be forced to wear prison uniforms. Um, one of the kindnesses of, of the prison authorities had been to allow them to wear non-prison clothes in recognition, really, uh, of, of who they are and what their status is in the country, jailed political activists. But here you have uh, uh, one detainee talking about uh, his experience uh, in being arrested. You want to just... Uh, two, nine, uh, 2009, for about three months. And also the third time I was supposed to be in the prison, but that time I was in Lebanon for treatment. That's why they, first, they did not arrest me. But I was supposed to be arrested because we had a new room, of course. And uh, this is uh, this time, of course, when I came back from Lebanon uh, on 26th of uh, February after the protest in South Lebanon and the revolution started in Bahrain. On the 17th of, of uh, March 2000, they arrested me again. Of course, they tortured me. And this is the worst time for me, at least. I've been arrested different times, but this is the worst one. I mean, they had me, they did everything. Uh, of course, I've been sentenced forever for just my opinion. I mean, in 1995, I was, or I have been arrested for my opinion for uh, I mean, struggling for democracy, for human rights, for freedom, from that time until now. And this time also the same. I mean, uh, I'm going to go back on my world. Uh, uh, and I guess just, I think, in terms of that clip, and you saw the head of the Al-Haq movement speaking there, the, the, the men in jail, the 13 political activists who were focused on, and the Bicky report focused on, are long-time political activists. They are people who have dedicated their lives to being part of the political movement, the reform movement uh, uh, in uh, Bahrain. And some of them have been handed life sentences. Uh, and life sentences uh, on charges that include, you know, uh, 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 terrorism or sedition or, or, or conspiracy to overthrow the regime as, as criminal offenses, uh, even though the government well knows these are people they have been dealing with politically. These are the opposition uh, in Bahrain, the political opposition in Bahrain. Uh, and, you know, you get a sense, as, as, as he's describing, these are people who have been in and out of prison and part of the cycle of, of giving a little and taking back a lot that the Bahraini government has uh, been engaging in for decades. Um, the next person we've clipped here is Nabil Rajab, who is the president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights uh, and uh, has, was arrested sort of separately from the other political activists outside the uh, uprising protests for uh, uh, illegal, organizing an illegal protest. Right now, basically, any protest is illegal. So anytime you're involved in a protest, you're doing something illegal. And he was sentenced to, to three years in prison. Uh, he's also a member of our um, Human Rights Watch Middle East uh, North Africa Advisory Committee. As far as uh, Human Rights Watch is there, is, I'm active. Keep me here a year, keep me two years, keep me three years. I'm going to fight for human rights. Not only in my country, in the whole region. It's an obligation. I have the strength, I have the power to, uh, to do that, and I'm going to do that. I want to improve the situation of human rights in my country. Of course, with the help of human rights group like Human Rights Work, we've done it great in the past few years, but there are a lot to be done. Did you have other comments, perhaps, about uh, Miriam's? Uh, yeah, I guess, 
coming back or, or, or at the conclusion of uh, our visit to Bahrain, where we you know, met, spent a lot of time meeting, particularly with the heads of the security agencies, the Ministry of Interior and the public prosecutor, um, our assessment was that the government had failed in the two most critical areas of reform. And this was a very strong conclusion and a harsh conclusion. You know, the, the headlines of the news was no real reform in Bahrain. And the government was very upset about that because they wanted to talk about the fact that they had appointed a police ombudsman and they wanted to talk about how they had been working closely with a UK firm to do police training. Um, and the bottom line is two things. Um, there's no real reform in Bahrain because there is impunity. There's no accountability. And as Mariam was pointing out, the people who carried out these gross abuses uh, against uh, thousands of people in Bahrain, um, these violent suppression of the uprisings, these were not just Pakistani and Iraqi police officers who on their own decided to suppress protests. Um, these were orders from above at the highest levels, and yet there has been no accountability at the highest levels, and the same people who took these decisions uh, to use live ammunition on protesters, uh, to uh, beat, arrest, and torture uh, uh, detainees, are still the ones sitting in power talking to us about the reforms they're making in the government. Uh, and even aside from the absence of criminal prosecutions, of anyone above the battalion commander level, which basically is a very small, low-level uh, commander level. Um, there's not even been any internal accountability at the Ministry of Interior, uh, as in, okay, well, maybe you're not gonna go to jail, but we'll fire you, we'll demote you, we'll take you out of active duty. We won't put you in a position to make decisions about how police forces are deployed in protests. None of that has happened. Um, and second of all, uh, the political activists in the country, the human rights activists in the country, remain in jail. Um, one of the recommendations of the Bikki Report, and one of our recommendations, and the recommendations of every international and domestic human rights organization that talks about reform in Bahrain, is that if the government wants to be serious about Bahrain, that it has to release its political prisoners. And that means overturning the life sentences against them, which in some cases have been affirmed by the highest court of the land um, because you can't have reform if the opposition is in jail. That's what President Obama actually said. Um, but sadly, right now, there is no real pressure uh, from uh, 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 the US and the UK who have the strongest role to play in Bahrain uh, to make those releases happen. Can and you so, talk about what happens when you go talk to the State Department about this? What do they, what do they say to you? Uh, well, they say they agree with us that these things need to happen, but at the same time they talk about the important security interests that the country has, uh, even though, for example, the former commander of the uh, Pacific Fleet, uh, uh, former naval commander of the United States, has said, Dennis Blair, that the U.S. should withdraw its uh, Fifth Fleet functionaries uh, from outside of Bahrain, that it's not a security threat to the U.S. if that happens, and an important role, an important message in saying we're not going to just sit by and have business as usual. Um, the U.S. government has done none of that. And in fact, the U.S. government has resumed arms transfers. Doesn't Bahrain need the Fifth Fleet as much as we need to station it somewhere? I mean, don't, don't we have any power over what happens in Bahrain? Or you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the, there are many instances of, of the dog wagging the, I'm sorry, the tail wagging the dog. and. Uh, I think you cannot look at Bahrain in isolation, certainly in terms of how the U.S. looks at Bahrain. The U.S. looks at Bahrain as a package with Saudi Arabia uh, and the rest of the Gulf, and, and the GCC as a unit tries to present that very much as a, what you do in Bahrain is what you're doing to all of us. And so it's, it's, a, it's a tense situation. But you know, the, I think they're even worse, I think, than the U.S.'s wobbly, waffly position of really talking out of both sides of its mouth. Uh, is the UK position, um, which you know the, the UK ambassador has actually gone to lengths to attack and criticize human rights organizations, uh, both inside Bahrain and, for example, Human Rights Watch as, as being you know, as exaggerating and uh, not focusing on the positive reforms, uh, you know, while at the same time organizing junkets for UK businesses to resume their uh, uh, business with Bahrain. By the way, there's a um, we'll put this on our website at the link to this. Uh, Adam Curtis the great uh, BBC uh, 
journalist who just mines the archives there all the time, on his blog has a 1961 or something BBC interview with the King's uh, main aide at the time, who was this British colonel straight out of uh, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and just absolutely blood-curdlingly disgusting person, just the way he talked about you know, British interests in Bahrain and so yeah. forth. We'll, we'll let you see that, but, uh, but anyway. Did you, did you have some comments about U.S. Uh, in terms of, of what Obama could be doing differently if he? Definitely, I feel like, you know, it's when we're looking at international accountability for human rights abuses, even the basic minimum has not been done towards Bahrain. When we're talking about, you know, accountability at the UN level, whether the Human Rights Council or, or the Security Council or otherwise, whether we're talking about, you know, holding accountable the people who we know are violators. Why is it that the United States, for example, or the UK or the EU or all of them cannot draw up a list of names like they did with Russia through the Magnitsky Bill that was passed through Congress, put a list of names together that we know are human rights violators and say, well, these people will have their assets frozen. These people will be banned from visiting the United States and so on and so forth. Just that in itself does hold people accountable. But the problem with Bahrain is not just in the regime believing that they have international impunity. It's the fact that they're right about it. Hmm. I, you were making a final, a final point. Um, um, I mean, right now, I think one of our main concerns is what the future is for organizations like the one that Mariam uh, uh, is heading right now, the, the civil society organizations of Bahrain, which are really unique and remarkable in the region because I can tell you, you know, 95% of the active civil society groups in all of the Gulf are in Bahrain. And uh, Bahraini civil society is truly a standout representation in the region, and that's because there has been a more democratic climate and a more active civil society uh, in Bahrain than anywhere else. But these organizations are all at threat because the new NGO law, uh, I guess part of the reform package that the government is offering up, uh, that the Minister of Social Welfare is offering up, um, basically is going to give the minister the authority to shut down or uh, uh, not allow to be registered or legal any organization that she doesn't want, uh, it, she has complete and 100% discretion to decide for no reason whatsoever, without giving any reason, that an organization uh, should not exist in Bahrain. Um, and so this law has already sort of passed the parliamentary committee and supposed to be voted on, but we're actually very concerned that the voices uh, uh, of Bahrain that are doing real human rights work, that are gathering facts and evidence and and speaking human rights language are now, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the big target of the Bahraini government. Of course, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights is already illegal in Bahrain. You're the president of a legal organization. <laughs> Ruth, do you want to make some comments? Well, I, I sort of wandered into this issue by inadvertence <laughs> uh, because Mariam came to uh, Freedom House and to accept the uh, award from the organization, which just as a plug since we're in downtown New York, and this is an old downtown kind of labor left organization. Freedom House was founded many, many years ago. Wendell Wilkie and Eleanor Roosevelt as a bipartisan group, uh, right, left, and center. And uh, I think its virtue is that there are indeed so many issues upon which everyone can agree. And she gave a very charismatic address at our uh, annual fundraising dinner, which was quite successful, largely due to her. Uh, and that really was, that, that and also knowing Sharif Bassiano, uh, Bassioni and... Uh, he was uh, the head of the com International Committee that was brought in by the government to do a right. report. And also his wife, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mike Reisman's wife, Manoush Arsanjani, who was part of that fact-finding mission. Um, and, fr and frankly also third, because although I've not been to, to Bahrain, I was in Daman about the same time that Sarah was in Saudi. And when I attempted to be my usual redolent, amusing self with some of the women in Daman, they were very, very frightened of speaking. Quite innocent questions you might ask at a mixer or cocktail party, uh, they were afraid to answer because clearly anybody who was on the Gulf was seen by the uh, Saudi regime as a, a source of potential trouble, that somehow the entire Gulf Coast would be presumptively pro-Iranian and therefore they felt quite inhibited about speaking of any issue that might even seem, to my mind, uh, 
quite oblique. Um, and then I guess a friend of mine, who you know, uh, called me up and said, did I know that law professors could nominate people for Nobel Prizes? And uh, turned out we can, so anybody, Arya, if you want, uh, for the right price, we can no nominate you. Um, <laughs> and I, I didn't know I could do this either, but I was willing to gamble my $44 stamp and my email. And I knew Geir Lundestad quite a long time ago. He was at Yale one time, and uh, he actually spoke of how he saw this Nobel Prize, which is the Norwegian Nobel Prize, not the Swedish Nobel Prize, as an instrumental prize. That's good and bad, but, but uh, it's not retrospective, it's prospective, which is that their view of it is, it is a goad to future action. So I thought, what the hell? Um, what more attractive person could you have? To, 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 uh, so we nominated the whole family. This would also be a... Uh, and it turned out there were several nominations of the whole family at the um, same time. So yeah. they will have to share the money if they get it. Um, <laughs> uh, but but I, 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 th I think I mean, just putting on my realist hat for a moment, I mean, the real difficulty here in real life terms is uh, folks in Washington are terrified of Iran. And I think the probably ignorantly, the working presumption is that anybody who's Shia must be pro-Iranian. And I would suspect that just as among Jews, there are as many varieties of Shia as you can shake a stick at. And the, in fact, having Iran as a very large neighbor might be the very uh, instant, the very, the, the very impetus to not necessarily be naive about the nature of the Iranian regime. So I think the, the, the conflation that anybody who's Shia, therefore, is somehow a security threat, and therefore their majority rule in, uh, in uh, Bahrain should be uh, resisted is too simple, obviously. Um, but I mean, clearly one of the curses in life is to be the center of security interests. And since the U.S. now has the fifth fleet there and uh, puts its Air Force uh, fighters, F-15s, F-16s, uh, KC-135s, flying out of there, and because it really is, I, I didn't think to make a slide for you, but uh, if, if you're looking at the theaters to which uh, Bahrain is, 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 is uh, strategically located. It's sort of the, the center of the map for getting to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq. You've got the map behind you. Oh, you do, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, well, that map, yes. But if you look at the, just at the flight patterns. Uh, so in, in, in one sense, I think, uh, for human rights people, the, uh, pardon my basso voice, by the way, I have a lingering cold. Um, w w one of the difficulties is that uh, uh, the US, UK have invested a lot of money, and this is a, as a host country, what if the, what if the uh, uh, ruling regime kicked us out? Where would we go? How would it operate? But at the same time, I think, even from the most realist point of view, uh, if in fact a country is going to have continuing uh, dissension and protests and is not ethically, politically stable, it's not a very good long-term um, uh, port in a storm, if you will. So in that sense, I think, uh, strongly counseling the ruling family that they ought to get a little bit more with modernity and figure out ways that people could can participate in government and uh, that this is not necessarily a zero-sum game of Iran, not Iran, is something that would, uh, it's kind of like the, the, the realist's argument for human rights. It's, 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 a, it's a way to accommodate dissension and, to, to, and, and, and differing views without destabilizing the fundamental ethical, moral, political commi commitments of a regime. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curse to be strategic because people feel that they have to uh, go with what is for, for, for the sake of their own uh, self-interest. Um, but uh, cl clearly there are things the regime could do that would accommodate dissentient opinion. You don't have to beat people. You don't have to put them in jail. You can even allow them to vote. Uh, there still is a king. The Human Rights Committee has never as such, I guess, confronted with the King of Belgium and the King and the uh, Prince of Liechtenstein, held that monarchy itself is per se illegal under the right to participate in politics. So nothing in the covenant on civil and political rights would forbid having a king as such. Uh, but there is a right to take part in government under the covenant on civil and political rights. And it can be different voting schemes, upper house, lower house, uh, but still to have no rule, no, no voice in government is seen as unacceptable. And clearly under Article 6 and 7 of the uh, covenant, torture and, uh, and arbitrary killing is forbidden. So that whatever the government, whatever its ambitions, if it uses 
modalities that are just per se uh, uh, illegal and atrocious. Uh, that is hardly a, a route to stability or to gaining the, uh, the uh, happy support of their people. Um, again, I, I, I've said oftentimes, and I, and I still hold to it, I would not, I think, personally have the physical courage, maybe the moral courage, but not the physical courage, to be a human rights activist in most parts of the world. I think it really requires a kind of uh, out-of-body uh, courage, which I would lack, frankly. I think I would lack it, who knows? Perhaps people rise to the occasion. So in that sense, certainly, too, I have great admiration for any family that's willing to risk everything uh, to stand up for a principle that's worth uh, uh, championing. And, and I do think, frankly, um, and I'm not there anymore. I've, I've had a mixed life, as, as Ren knows. Um, but if I were inside the Department of Defense, I would counsel people to think through carefully uh, what is the likeliest ingredients for stability. That it may not be what it seems of simply uh, cajoling the regime and its short-term interests. What kind, of reaction, what kind of reaction do you think you would get? When mm -hmm. you were, what kind of reaction do you think you would get if you were saying that? It probably depends who you ask. Str mm -hmm. Strangely enough, um, combatant commanders, and the, the, great, the great surprise to a, to a born and bred New Yorker is that combatant commanders, hi higher level commanders of the, in the military, whether they're Army, Navy, Air Force, are often really remarkably attuned to the political ebb and flow of the places in which they're stationed, often much more so than, than diplomats. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, there's a lot of sunk cost in Bahrain, lots of things that are expensive to recreate. But with charm, wit, cajoling, I wouldn't suggest the combatant commander go out and demonstrate in the street. But there are ways of having a mano, a mano, you know, get real, I'm on your side, but conversation, uh, which can be persuasive to people on the ground. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, human rights should not be a specialized function of one person in the embassy. It should be a general policy of the U.S. government mm -hmm. and to be uh, taken account of and communicated in all of the various uh, modalities of our, of our presence. Be, our before countries. I go on to Arya, I just wanted to ask you to comment a little bit on, uh, on the Shia situation and, and how that's playing out. Well, I think, you know, when we talk about the Iranian threat, quote unquote, uh, when it comes to the Bahraini issue, it's always interesting to look at the use of uh, the threat du jour by the Bahraini government mm -hmm. over the past about 80, 90 years. And if we go all the way back to the 1920s, the entire opposition in Bahrain was labeled as Nasser socialists, which was seen as the threat at that time. And then N they were- Nasser, so from Nasser. Yes, yeah. okay, right. from Nasser in Egypt. And then they were all labeled as communists, which was also seen as the threat later on at that time. And then afterwards, they were all labeled as Iranian agents. And now they're labeled as terrorists and Iranian agents. So whatever is seen during the time as being the international threat, that's what the Bahraini government will label the entire opposition with to try and garner international support for the crackdown that they conduct. So they've used this as a tool uh, across many, many uh, years to try and garner international support or at least for getting, you know, if not support, but at least silence on the human rights abuses that they commit. But speaking very quickly about the Sunni Shia situation inside Bahrain, when people came out in Bahrain demanding freedom mm -hmm. and dignity and you know, a new constitution, they didn't do it as Sunnis or Shias. They did it as Bahrainis. It wasn't about whether you're Sunni or Shia. And I actually, as a Bahraini, take it to offense when people say that it's only the Shias that make those demands. No, the Sunnis want freedom and dignity and democracy just as much as the Shias want. It's not something that is specific to sect. It's something that's specific to human beings. And so when people came out to make these demands, they made it as Bahrainis. Of course, what the government did is they initiated in March 2011 a very sectarian crackdown. Basically, what they did is they demolished sectarian, uh, they demolished uh, Shia mosques around 35 or 36 Shia mosques. Um, you know, they went after people according to their sect. If you were Shia, you were prone to get arrested, beaten, tortured. You lose your job. If you get stepped at a checkpoint, you're verbally assaulted or uh, physically assaulted, just because you're Shia. And they did this for two reasons. One, because they wanted to send a very strong message to the Sunni community within Bahrain that this is not your business. Stay out of it. Our problem is with the Shias. And in that sense, they divide and conquer. 
As long as the people of Bahrain are united, it makes it more difficult for the government to regain control over the situation. But the second reason is because they knew, as soon as internationally speaking, they can present the situation in Bahrain as being a Shia uprising, they don't even need to say it. It's automatically linked to Iran and Hezbollah. And so that's what they did. Hmm. Are you? Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, first, um, I don't con I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on Bahrain. Um, I have never been to Bahrain. Uh, I've never uh, focused um, strongly uh, on Bahrain. I've known uh, a handful of Bahrainis uh, over the years, but that's the, uh, the extent of my knowledge. I did have the, uh, the pleasure of um, helping to select the Bahrain Center for Human Rights for uh, an award named for Roger Baldwin uh, that was presented by um, Human Rights First and to take part uh, in presenting uh, the award to, uh, to Mariam uh, several months ago. Um, but um, the, the, the comment I, I have to make is really about uh, the way in which um, United States policy um, seems to me to be um, reminiscent of and, and wholly consistent with um, what uh, I didn't like about uh, United States policy um, in the, uh, the Cold War period. And in, in the Cold War period, it seems to me that the, the struggle that human rights um, activists had was to try to um, isolate um, the human rights concern from the geopolitical concern. Uh, that is, if, if human rights were seen through a geopolitical lens, uh, then there was um, always a reason not to intervene, uh, not to take a strong stand when uh, it was uh, one's geopolitical allies who happened to be uh, those who were engaged in, in human rights abuses. And many officials regarded us, um, perhaps correctly, as naive uh, in trying to, um, uh, to separate uh, human rights uh, from um, uh, geopolitics. Uh, but it seemed to me uh, you really could not um, uh, promote human rights unless you were willing uh, to separate the two. That is, you had to be willing to um, deal with human rights abuses regardless of the, uh, the geopolitical alignments uh, of those who were uh, engaged in, in abuses. My, my own sense of what is happening um, more broadly in the Middle East today uh, is that we have uh, a somewhat uh, analogous um, geopolitical uh, situation. Um, the, the problem is that the, um, the dominant factors in the, uh, the Middle East are two repressive regimes. Um, but one is on our side and one is our enemy. Uh, that is, our enemy is Iran and the one on our side is Saudi Arabia. And essentially, there is um, a struggle going on between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. And it's really a struggle uh, to the death. It's the struggle to the death of many Syrians uh, today. Um, and um, in that um, uh, circumstance, um, those who happen to be um, aligned um, with uh, the repressive regime that we consider to be um, our friend um, are not likely to be the, um, uh, the targets of uh, major human rights uh, denunciations. Uh, and those who may be, um, uh, we think for one reason or another, perhaps by religious affinity, um, aligned with uh, our geopolitical enemy, uh, the Iranians are not those uh, on whose behalf um, we are going to come uh, riding to the, uh, to the rescue. 
Uh, and so Saudi Arabia has um, intervened strongly um, in Bahrain uh, on behalf of the, um, the government uh, of Bahrain. And uh, I think the, the real uh, geopolitical interest of the United States is not so much uh, the Fifth Fleet. Um, it is uh, maintaining um, the alliance uh, with Saudi Arabia because we depend a great deal more on Saudi Arabia than we do on the Fifth Fleet's um, bases um, in uh, Bahrain. Uh, and the assumption uh, is uh, that uh, since the majority of the population uh, in Bahrain is Shia, and the monarchy is Sunni, um, that this is probably a struggle of the Shia to free themselves um, from the rule of a uh, Sunni monarchy, that this is probably something uh, that is in the interest of Iran. Uh, and so um, coming to the, uh, to the rescue, uh, of that uh, Shia population doesn't seem uh, to be a very smart thing to do uh, from a geopolitical standpoint. As I say, I don't believe that uh, you can actually have a human rights policy um, if it is going to be subordinate uh, to a ge geopolitical policy. I think you have to uh, be able to separate a human rights policy from um, a geopolitical policy and deal with human rights um, on its own merits. As I say, I don't know much about uh, what is going on uh, in Bahrain. Uh, the little that I do know gives me the impression that there are very serious uh, human rights abuses uh, taking place and that it would be appropriate um, to um, uh, speak out um, on uh, these uh, human rights abuses, the kinds of what are called uh, sometimes smart sanctions uh, that, that Mariam has talked about, uh, where you, uh, you prohibit uh, people from uh, traveling to the United States, you, go, you say you're going to freeze their accounts, probably would be a bit more effective uh, than putting some Russian officials um, on that um, as uh, the, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, did recently with respect to the Magnitsky case uh, in, in Russia. If the Europeans did the same thing, probably that would have um, uh, a uh, substantially enhanced um, impact. I think the United States, especially if it could persuade um, Europe to go along, could have a significant impact on the human rights situation in Bahrain, but I don't think it can be done until one is willing to say human rights has to be um, looked at in its own terms, on its own merits, separate from geopolitical concerns. That doesn't mean that geopolitical concerns don't matter. Uh, they matter a great deal, um, but um, you can't really have a human rights policy unless you can isolate human rights from those geopolitical concerns. Are you, are you surprised uh, following Obama's uh, Nobel Prize, his speech in Cairo, and everything that, that you can't really tell the difference between this foreign policy and some of the earlier ones you had to deal with? Um, Did you think you'd I'm, still be I'm, dealing with this right now? I, I would say I'm disappointed, but not uh, overwhelmingly surprised. Um, uh, I, I would have hoped um, uh, for um, more. Um, you know, I can think of a few people um, Obama brought into his administration who I think um, uh, were um, more inclined uh, to the, uh, the approach that I'm uh, proposing of looking at human rights uh, solely in its um, own terms. Um, and I would have hoped that uh, Obama would have um, been influenced uh, by uh, those persons. But you know, uh, there was a struggle in the, uh, the earliest days of the Obama administration uh, when Greg Craig was appointed as White House counsel, uh, 
uh, and Rahm Emanuel was appointed as the, uh, the chief of staff. And, you know, Greg uh, represented the, um, uh, the human rights um, uh, uh, approach that, uh, that I am uh, advocating, and he lost, and uh, he uh, lost his position um, relatively quickly. So uh, that uh, showed me which way the, uh, the wind was blowing. So I, I'm disappointed, but I, I'm, I'm not surprised. I think we should open for a few minutes of questions. We have uh, right there and right there. So go to the microphone if you can, if you want to line up. There's a microphone right behind you, and maybe you, we'll start with you. Yeah. Go ahead. But, but brief. Yes, sir. <laughs> I know the rules, sir. <laughs> so it will be not Okay, is the microphone on here? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. So talk into the microphone so we can hear you. Assalamu alaikum. Motorma and Motormi. My closer, you have to talk, yeah, lean into it. Assalamu alaikum. Motorma and Motormi. Viewing the 200 plus history of America, when the first, second president of the United States, he tell the Jewish Noha that he should take 100,000 Israeli and occupy Syria. At that time, Palestine was the well, part of the Syria. Okay. I am coming, sir, to the question. Okay. Give only me, one give sentence. Me two more. Sentences. Yeah. Only one sentence more, and then I will close the question. <laughs> it was Roosevelt who said that I will kick out one Palestinian, and I will bring one Jews, and I will put a barbed wire around them. So my question to you is that I commend you that human rights, they are the most important thing. What Muslim has done to America, that our sister, our brothers, they are butchered for the last 100 years. And if you go to Crusader, it is 1,000 years butchery of the Muslims. How we are called terrorists, when thousands of miles away, British and French, they came 1,000 years ago, and they want to take away our so what expectation a Muslim has, or Muslim Ummah has, from the Americans for any fair, uh, fair, uh, fair treatment? treatment. Okay. Let's take a few questions and, 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 and then add sort of them all together. So go ahead. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your speeches. Um, thank you for coming here, Miriam. And I'm, you mentioned earlier on that your organization is banned in uh, uh, Bahrain, and uh, but you were just able recently to travel to see your uh, sister, and just uh, more largely, what are your activities um, limited to, or like what are you able to do, the, like given the certain current current situation in Bahrain, and what can like be achieved, given that I guess I don't know how freely you're able to travel back and forth and act, uh, be active in your country. Let's take one more question, and we'll. Can I get time? Yeah. 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 Uh, could you please discuss a little bit about uh, the effect of social media that um, like Facebook and Twitter have uh, on the Bahrain uprising? You're talking to a human thumb here. <laughs> <laughs> when you go out for lunch with her. <laughs> but anyway, um, why don't you answer some of those uh, sure. uh, first? So. Thank you for your questions. Um, as to what can be expected from the United States and from the UK and other Western countries is that they do their responsibility towards human rights. Um, whether or not they themselves have committed human rights violations or not, um, they still have a responsibility towards human rights and especially ally countries. I think you know when we evaluate whether different countries have a good position on human rights or not, we shouldn't ask whether they're holding their enemies accountable. We should ask whether they're holding their allies accountable. That's how you know whether they have a good position on human rights or not. So I think that's what we need to expect from them. Um, Arya, use that next time. Mm -hmm. That was really good. <laughs> okay. What can be done in our activities abroad? Personally, uh, I left Bahrain in March 2011, and the first time I went back was last January. And I think, you know, my situation is definitely not representative of many Bahrainis. I think if I was anyone else, I probably would have been taken from the airport straight to prison. 
And I have in the past uh, recommended that they create a family cells so that we can all at least be in the same place, but albeit they don't take my advice. Um, but you know, what I've been doing in our main focus, in the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, we have two different sections. We have a section for documentation, where people actually do the documentation on the ground of the human rights violations. And then we have a section abroad that actually that works on international advocacy and making sure that the international community knows about what's going on on the ground. Because it's not enough to just write reports and statements. You need to, you need to make sure that people hear about it. Um, and I, I always like to compare ourselves or to say that we work as sort of a meg megaphone for the people on the ground. What they can't relate to the outside, it's our job to relay it. Um, so that's what we do mostly abroad. Uh, in regards to social media, um, of course, there are those who like to call the revolutions of the Middle East and North Africa region as the Twitter revolution or the Facebook revolution, which is a term that I don't personally like. I think that these were the youth revolutions or the dignity revolutions. That explains it much better. But instruments or tools like Twitter and Facebook have been instrumental to the movements on the ground especially in places like Bahrain where you've had more or less of a blackout when it comes to a mainstream media covering the issues on the ground. You don't see much coverage of the situation on the ground, internationally speaking, unfortunately. And so what many activists and many youth have done inside Bahrain is they've utilized tools like Twitter and Facebook <coughs> as their means of getting their stories out. And so Bahrain actually has, one, has a very high uh, Twitter activity rate. Um, and you have thousands and thousands of people on Twitter who actively, if you follow Twitter today and you follow the case of Bahrain, you can get a minute by minute update of what's happening on the ground. And this is literally happening with you when I go to lunch with you. You are, <laughs> yes, I mean, exactly. what, what are you doing with that machine? So basically what we do is we use social media in different ways. We use it as a way of coordination as human rights defenders. So I actually coordinate with my colleagues through Twitter. We do human rights documentation through Twitter. So my colleague, for example, goes and sits with a victim and, and uh, documents a case, and he writes it on Twitter. I go and read it on Twitter, along with thousands of other people, and that's how I get the information to write the report. Um, and so we use this, of course, as a way, but it's not all that we use. We, of course, need more details than what we put out on Twitter. Um, but it's, it is one of the ways that we use it. And then, of course, people use it for coordination on the ground. For example, one person, there's a hashtag called checkpoints. And if you pass through a checkpoint where you're harassed or verbally assaulted or whatnot, what you do is you say that in this location there's a checkpoint right now and you put the hashtag. And then other people around the country are following that hashtag so they know not to go to that area to avoid that checkpoint. So it's something that's being utilized on a day-to-day -day basis um, as a means for coordination for security, but also as a means of putting pressure on the government. So for example, one of the smart things that the February 14th coalition does is they'll announce that on this day there'll be a massive protest but they won't announce the time. And so what the government does is they close down the entire area since 5 a.m. in the morning just to try and prevent that protest from happening. And they actually serve the purpose of the protest, which is closing down the area. And then, for example, around 5 p.m., they'll come out on Twitter and be like, okay, now we're going to start gathering. You know, after you know, the riot police have been out there for many, many hours. So they've been utilizing these tools as a way of communication, as a way of organizing, as a way of coordination in many different ways, but of course, I'm not going to get into too much details, but of course it's also used as a double-edged sword because the regimes and the governments in the, in the region have also started utilizing it for their own crackdowns and identifying or you know, going after people who are active on Twitter. We had a lawyer recently who had his home raided at, uh, around midnight. His family members were beaten and he was taken away and you know, we all thought that this was going to be a terrorism charge. And the next day we found out that the charge against him was operating a Twitter account. Um, and so Twitter is seen as something as a big threat to the Bahraini government today because it's one of the means that people use to voice the opinion that they cannot voice in public. We're here. Hi. Hi, Mariam. How are you? Good. Well, thank you for this talk. This was very thank interesting. You. Actually, me and Mariam went to university together, so we know each other very well. <laughs> if you will allow me, like, I have a few comments and questions, like more than three from up to. Um, well, my first comment will be like to um, Sarah. I mean, you talked about how you struggle to get your visa to get to Bahrain and only be allowed there for five days. I mean, I don't understand why you should be so bothered because we all know how American visa system works. We have to fill in like 50 pages of information just to get here and go through second screening just because our last names are like Osama and Ali. So if it's a country's position to protect itself, then I think that should be respected. Uh, my questions to Maryam, one is related to the use of violence, and you said that the police do use violence. 
And we all know that the government did admit at some points that they did something wrong and they handled a lot of the issues very wrongly and they had the decency to come out and say like, listen people, we did this wrong so that's why we're gonna have this commission and that's why we're gonna do this and came up with solutions. How would you react to the violence acted by the protesters, the oil spells before the cars came and passed by so people would die? A lot of people died because of that. A lot of car accidents happened. And not only that, the Molotov bombs and the burning tires and the iron rods and everything else. I could just go on and on. I mean, we've all been, I mean, whatever party or whatever part of Bahrain you live in, you've been subjected to violence, whether by the protesters or by the police. So at least at the police, maybe you mentioned the reforms that are not being fully implemented or they're not, there are no real reforms, but we all know like if the protesting keeps on happening on the streets every day, then who's gonna stop it? We can just sit back and watch. The police has to be there and if they had to act with a, and if they had to use a, what do you call it, a tear gas? I mean, a lot of countries do use that and not only Bahrain, so. I don't know why or how you would allow other countries to use it and give it like a green light and not Bahrain as a country. Um, about, and you also mentioned the protest that happened in March in 2011 where people stopped going to work. I would say it's, it was more of a forced civil disobedience because we all wanted to go to work and they blocked every main highway in the country. I was stuck in traffic for three hours, why? Because I was simply prevented from going to my office, why? Was I part of the protest? No, I wasn't. Was I part of the police? No, I wasn't. I was just a normal citizen trying to get to work and I was prevented from that. Then, no, not all people stopped going to work. Some people were forced. I just wanted to say that. And about accountability, a lot of people, even like seniors, were held accountable and a lot of them have been subjected to investigations. And um, some of them got fired. I don't know if you know about that, but it's, it's an ongoing process and the reform is maybe slow, but it's surely happening. And speaking of reforms, like you're always pointing the fingers to the government and what has the government done for reforms and what has the government done to protect its people. What, but my question is, what did the opposition do for reforms as well? Are they just well, waiting for the government to do all the job? Let, let's let Miriam respond. And okay. I have just one more comment. Okay, one more. It takes two to tango. We're as opposition's party, we're right here as a government trying when, I mean, as a supporter of what my government I think would do because I saw it, I've witnessed it, I've been part of it. So I'm waiting for the opposition here to interact with me and to give me some reforms and, and solutions so we can move forward. And let's not talk about the past, we have a future ahead of us. So let's do something about it. What are your reforms? Just give me something. Thank you. So you've got a, your plate full. First of all, it's good to see you, Fatima. And yes, we were friends. Um, to speak about the decency of the government and their recognition of their mistakes. Yes, the government did recognize that they made mistakes and they fully accepted the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry and all of the different violations which could amount to crimes against humanity that were actually reported in this report. The problem isn't with their recognition. Their recognition was applauded across the world. The problem is, what did they actually do about it? The fact that excessive use of force not only continues, but to some extent increased on the streets against protesters is the problem. When we are recording cases after the uh, BICI report, where police officers, this is something they didn't do before, started carrying knives and cutting up protesters that they caught, including minors, as a way to scare protesters from going out on the streets, it doesn't matter really if they recognized that this was a mistake. The question is, what do they do after that recognition? Yes, recognition is great. So, okay, let's go back a little bit further, right? So the protest started in Bahrain, completely peaceful, no violence, right? There were people were shot and people carried flowers. The police shot them and people carried flowers. And this continued for quite some time. And this was a recognition that was awarded to the Bahrainis internationally for the amount of peacefulness that they presented despite the gover government-run systematic use of ex excessive use of force against peaceful protesters.
right? So this happened. And then what happened is a while later, there were a couple of youth or a group of youth who decided to use things like Molotov cocktails and stones, the way you pointed out, as a means to them of self-defense. Now, of course, as for us as human rights defenders, we do not condone violence on any side for any reason. But we do look at things through context. If you want to resolve an issue of violence when it happens on the streets, you have to look at the reasons and how you can address it to stop the violence from happening. Now, what happened in the 1990s, where the government, again, you had much more violence than what you see on the streets today from the protesters, and you had government-run systematic violence against protesters, what happened in, the 19, in 1999 was that when the government-run, state, systematic, state-run violence stopped, so did the street violence. Because one of, these, one of these situations of violence was a reaction to another. And so our position, of course, like I said, we do not condone violence. But again, to see it from context, and you, a lot of the times we have to be reminded, you do not blame the victim for, um, you do not blame the victim, but rather you blame the act which <coughs> caused the victim to react the way that they're reacting. And this is how you resolve issues of violence. So again, this is, you know, on the issue of the government recognizing that they made a mistake, great. But then what are the steps that they take after that to stop these things from happening again? But don't you think that the, the protesters are the one who started it? Because we all know that they were protesting for a whole month of February. Of February. <laughs> and when they attacked them at the roundabout <coughs> at the middle of the night, they did come on TV and they said that was very unexpected because someone gave that order, but not the whole government knew about it. That's one. And then they were allowed to be you know, protesting peacefully at the roundabout. And then what happened is that they, when they forced the civil disobedience, this is when things went down the drain. Like they attacked the universities, they attacked the highways, they attacked a lot of public um, properties. So I think they're the ones who started it. I mean, I'm not blaming anybody in here, but I'm saying they were giving their right. Yes, I am blaming the protesters a little <laughs> because they were giving their right to protest peacefully when they had the chance. And it was going to continue that way. Okay, let it me respond to that. It was going to continue that. that way. I need to respond to this and then I need to get to your other points and then you can respond to me again. Um, so on the issue of who started what. Um, when you have people protesting peacefully, there's something called the right to assembly which means that people have the right to protest. You know, just a week ago, I actually saw this happening in Copenhagen, where people closed off the entire city center, and the police were actually helping organize this. And I was really angry because I was trying to get the bus to go home, right? I had a lot of work to do, and I was there for about an hour and a half waiting for a bus to come, and it did not come because those people wanted to protest. And they were protesting for legalizing marijuana. <laughs> right? And yet, the government was actually helping them to organize this protest because Maybe they the have... Maybe needed marijuana. Who knows? Because they have a right to assembly. Well, let's, Wait, let's let me just finish responding to your points and then you can get back to me. Right? Um, now, on the issue of attacks, I was there on the 17th of February when people were attacked while they were sleeping on the, in the roundabout. Women, children, and men. And a government that doesn't know that there's going to be a crackdown of that kind inside their country, I mean, that's not a government that works I very well. I didn't say the whole government. Their okay. orders given. Right, okay. but you said that there were factions of the government that didn't know. I'm trying to make a point. And so... You can't do this. Yeah, 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 right. It's not a conversation. Okay, oh, wait, 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 wait. Do, make a few more comments, because we're gonna end in a few minutes, and then you guys yeah. can continue. I'll just respond bit. very quickly. Wait, wait, wait. It'll be very quickly. Um, about street violence, like I said, again, we do not condone uh, street violence. And the fact that the police have to be there to protect themselves. There are videotapes, recorded videotapes, tens of them, you can find them all on YouTube, where you, vit you witness riot police throwing Molotov cocktails and stones and iron rods at protesters. And so when you see protesters using these methods, which again, we do not condone, I'm going to repeat this every time, um, but when you see this happening, but you see the security forces using the very same behavior, how do you tell a 16-year-old boy who's either been arrested, sexually assaulted, seen his fr friend being killed at a protest, to not use the method that the riot police are using against him? How do you convince him that this is wrong when the government agents in uniform are using the very same methods against the protesters? That's where the problem lies when you have absolutely no decent training for these police who are using methods that they're not supposed to be using, when they're using excessive use of force against peaceful protests. Like my sister said in her 
in her letter. When you make peaceful protest impossible, people start turning to violence. And unfortunately, this has become the, system, the situation. Th that's actually Bahrain. JFK who said that. I mean, yeah. her quote. <laughs> let, let, let me, let um, me, because uh, uh, we're going to end in one second, in a few seconds, but I just want when your father was uh, in like the 110th day of his hunger strike, he sent out a, a thing about, yes. what did he say? So when my father was on his deathbed um, and we thought that he would die at any time, he actually issued a statement saying that even if he dies, he refuses or he asks people to not use violence in his name and that people should continue to use nonviolence as the main method of uh, disobedience or the main method of putting pressure on the government when it comes to actually making demands about freedom and democracy. But could I very quickly just make a few more comments? Okay. Does anyone mind? Okay, yeah, very quickly. Very quickly. Um, we have questions. Yeah, well, there, forced, we're, yeah, so very quickly. Forced disobedience in March. The, I was there during the beginning of that and then I left, but I had people on the ground who were relaying to me what was happening. And the only area that was actually closed off was the Pearl Square. Right? And everyone was talking about how this was ruining the country's economy and so on and so forth, and that's why they needed to clear the area of protesters. That area has been closed off and has been a military barracks since it was cleared of protesters. And so this notion of it stops the economy and stops, uh, creates traffic congestion is not something that is actually real. Um, seniors in government were held accountable. I can't think of one. Um, actually, there's a situation of Saran Musa, who was a police officer who tortured a journalist in Bahrain and who was found innocent. You have, um, what's her name? Hassa Al Khalifa. Hassa Al Khalifa? Is that her name? Brian? The police officer from the ruling family who tortured medics. Noura Al Khalifa. Noura Al Khalifa was involved in the torturing of doctors because they treated patients. She was given one trial and then it was taken away, dropped. No accountability. And then if we're going to talk about accountability, it actually goes all the way up to the king himself. Because as the head of the government, as the head of the entire system, he should be held accountable for the human rights abuses that are happening. And as a human rights defender, and this is not a political demand or a political goal, but as a human rights defender, I think that accountability should be at the very top level, including the king himself and the prime minister and the crown prince. And yes, this can, be, this can cause me to be taken to prison in Bahrain, but that is something that needs to be said. Um, blaming the government for no reforms, what about the opposition? The opposition can't implement reforms. That's, that's, that's not really how it works. The, the way that it works is that the government needs to stop committing human rights abuses. Now, I don't speak on behalf of the opposition, nor am I a member of the opposition in Bahrain. I'm a member of the human rights community. Um, you know, when we say, let's not talk about the past, let's look forward. It's, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind when we say let's not talk about the past is the mother who was screaming her son's, her 14 year old son's name after he was shot and killed by riot police. Let's tell her not to talk about the past. When we're saying let's not talk about the past, let's talk to the 16 year old boy who was sexually assaulted, tied up, and left half naked in the streets for his family to find him. Let's tell him not to talk about the past. These are the people that we should remember when we're saying, well, let's look forward. You know, there's a bright and flowery future, although it doesn't seem that way because the human rights situation continues to deteriorate. We're not looking at a situation where the human rights violations stopped and now we're making progress and saying, well, we need to look at the bright side and the bright future that we have ahead of us. No, we're actually looking at a human rights situation where it was bad and it's getting worse. And that's what we're looking at. It's a very dark future. And a lot of that is because of the lack of accountability on a local level, but also on an international level. So I say, yes, let's talk about the past and let's hold people accountable. Let me just, uh, I have to apologize to the people. We'll stay up here and you can come and talk to us, but we have to end pretty much. I just want to ask one question of you and then maybe the rest of you can just comment. But um, I asked you the thing about your father and nonviolence because in terms of looking at the dark future, do you think that the forces of nonviolence are losing uh, credibility in, in Bahrain? And what, what do you think the future is? Definitely. I actually would like to read a part of my sister's letter, which actually spoke about exactly this. Um, she says that it's a, she talks about the importance of not turning to violence and how painful it is for any citizen to see their country or their society starting to turn to violence as a means of protest. And she says, um, that the, uh, the brutal Al Khalifa regime intended to end the creative, peaceful revolution by using violence and spreading fear. In the face of this brutality, Bahrainis showed great restraint. Day after day, protesters held up flowers to soldiers and mercenaries who would shoot at them. Protesters stood with bare chests and arms raised, shouting, peaceful, peaceful. 
before they fell onto the ground covered in their own blood. Thousands of Bahrainis were detained and tortured for crimes such as illegal gathering and inciting hatred against the regime. Two years later, the Bahrain regime's atrocities continue. Bahrainis are still being killed, detained, injured, and tortured for demanding democracy. When I look into the eyes of Bahraini protesters today, too many times I see that the hope has been replaced by bitterness. The same bitterness Martin Luther King Jr. saw in the eyes of rioters in the slums of Chicago in 1966. He saw that the same people who had been leading nonviolent protests, willing to be beaten without striking back, were now convinced that violence is the only language the world understood. I, like King, find myself saddened to find some of the same protesters who faced tanks and guns with bare chests and flowers today asking, what's the use of nonviolence, of moral superiority, if no one is listening? Can we ask a question now? Well, I, I, I actually, I, I, I'm going to, it's, it's really late now. We've been going for almost two hours. But I just want to ask our panelists if they have any quick comments. To, uh, in, um, I guess since you've, I was you've, you've watched this whole thing too. Asked, and, and uh, uh, asked the question just in terms of the access to Bahrain, I guess what I would emphasize is um, the extent to which the government is going to great lengths to limit the access of journalists and human rights organizations to Bahrain. Um, and just as it's targeting uh, 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 civil society organizations uh, inside the country, um, it is uh, making it very hard for journalists from outside the country uh, and human rights investigators from outside the country uh, to come to Bahrain. So there is, uh, uh, it's difficult to tell the government side of the story if we can't be in the country uh, hearing what they have to say. Um, and just on the point of accountability, I think just as a matter of fact, uh, straight from the Minister of Interior's mouth, uh, he personally uh, said to me and confirmed to me that nobody above the level of battalion commander, which is a very low level police unit commander, filled completely uh, by non Bahrainis, uh, as in non, non Bahrainis. Uh, people from elsewhere. People from elsewhere. Uh, uh, nobody has been held accountable above that level. So it's just absolutely false that there has been any accountability at any senior level in government uh, for the abuses that took place. Any other last comments? Um, you know, I, I want to come back to your uh, question about uh, Obama. Um, and I would uh, say this. You know, uh, one of the things uh, we, um, we used to be able to do in the, uh, the human rights field is uh, we used to be able to exploit um, the um, foolishness uh, of um, some American public officials, uh, not only in remaining silent about human rights abuses, but actually speaking out um, as apologists uh, for those abuses. Um, we could then go after them, um, and that way we could um, generate a certain amount of pressure, and we made them into surrogate villains. You see, the thing about Obama is you can't make him into a surrogate villain. Um, uh, and so you don't really have uh, a point of leverage um, in trying to focus attention um, on the, uh, the, the human rights abuses. Basically, he doesn't do anything um, on uh, the, um, uh, the situation. And from his standpoint, that's a smarter position uh, than uh, being the apologist. Um, for uh, abuses, because it doesn't give the, the human rights community the same uh, opportunities as uh, when um, an American president becomes uh, the, um, uh, the apologist. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, um, you know, the trial is in a certain amount of difficulty, but the, um, the former dictator of uh, Guatemala, um, uh, if Ryan Rios Montt is on trial in Guatemala for genocide uh, in 1982 and 1983, uh, 30 years ago. And Ronald Reagan at that time uh, characterized the uh, allegations about Rios Montt as, quote, uh, 
uh, a bum rat. So if you have a Ronald Reagan, <laughs> you actually have more opportunity uh, to, um, uh, to make hay out of uh, the, um, uh, the actions uh, of an American president. Obama doesn't give you uh, any so opportunities what would you, what would you uh, recommend? Of, of that sort. What would you recommend so that it, Mariam it, do? It requires an extra level of creativity, uh, <laughs> I think, by, by those who are uh, trying to, um, uh, to deal with a human rights problem uh, because they don't have the, uh, the opportunities that we had many years ago. If, uh, if, I, yeah, go ahead. If I could just add, um, yeah. just, to, uh, just add one more thing uh, to Naria's, or Aria's uh, uh, description of the lack of a, of a, of a stuffed goose to, to squeeze. Um, it, it's not irrelevant to the Human Rights Committee to be concerned about the, just the de debilation, the entire disappearance of foreign affairs coverage in the American press. I mean, again, just taking Africa, which I care a great deal about. Mm -hmm. Howard French is teaching at Columbia. There's nobody left, nobody left covering it. Not whether Paul Kagame did the shoot down, not what's happening in, uh, with M23 in Eastern Congo. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it, it's hard to, uh, other than specialité de jour, mm -hmm. specialized organizations, which have their constituency, but are also more easily cabined and confined, dismissed, because they're always upset about something. But, but, but the old virtue of the Walter Cronkite mainstream press of giving a certain kind of sober authenticity to a, taking an issue and making it above dispute, uh, th that's gone now in, in, the, in the American press. So if you want to talk about uh, institutional development that ought to be remedied, it's, it's, it's I think, in some way making uh, the press more aware that uh, it's really not simply a matter of indifference that they have. Well, Shut off their own microphone. Well, summarizing both of your two points, uh, I would say that uh, we here at the Institute for the Humanities and the uh, Center for Human Rights and Global Justice are constantly trying to find ways of, of trumping the, the stupefied uh, indifference of both the press and of Obama, parenthetically. And that's why we invited ratcheting things up one level. Miriam, who, by the way, is our secret weapon because she's pretty terrific at this. And, and I would hope that, that she's catnip for the press and I hope they, they see more of her and that we wish you well on your continued work. I really am, I'm sorry, we, we, it's too late, but, we, but please come up here. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to finish, but come up here. One last announcement we have, you can sign up for our last events of the season. We have two major events coming up. Uh, at the Institute for Humanities, we do all kinds of things. We have a great event on Vermeer's daughter. We've done Abuladi's daughter here today, and we'll do Vermeer's daughter. It's a terrific story. And uh, then finally, our last event, on, that's May 18th, our last event on, May, on June 1st is Love and Let Die, The Looning Longevity, The Quality of Life, and The Coming Generational Smash-Up. And if you want to see more about that, we have cards out there. Thank you all for sticking with us, and thank you, Marianne. Thank you. 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 Th